my dudes. How do you pronounce this guy's last name? Alsup? You ever get nervous before debates? Usually, no, because I feel like I'm in the right and I know usually what I'm talking about, but um, I'm kind of wondering what's going to happen on, on this one. <laughs> I'm feeling like um, <laughs> this, there's got to be a huge bamboozle coming, right? I can't... There, There's no way to, like, unironically defend his point, right? I don't know. Let's... But I guess we'll find out. He spent three days at the gym studying birth control. Hello, hello? Hey, how's it going, man? Hey, oh. what's up? I'm not going to have cameras. Is that a big deal? That's fine. No, that's okay, fine. Cool. Um, yeah, just give me one second here. Yeah, no problem. And I, I'm live on my end, so don't say anything personal or phone numbers or anything like that. I don't know. Oh, you're live on your channel now? Yep. Okay, very cool, very cool. Yeah, I won't, uh, I won't dox myself then. Yeah. Good tip. Um, yeah, so I'm just thinking before we, before we, uh, pull the plug here and uh, go live on our channel um probably shooting for you know 30 minutes to an hour wherever it goes um you know not not a lot of structure i'm, I'm not big on the, the whole structure debate thing uh, as you may or may not have seen when my my previous debate so we'll just see where it goes and we'll uh we'll you know have a good time with it hopefully. Sure. sounds cool. good all right cool so i'll start the broadcast do the intro and then i'll i'll hand it off to you and you can you can start okay Good evening, folks, and welcome to everybody coming over from America First with Nick J. Fuentes. This is, of course, James Alsop here on America First Overdrive, and we have a very special guest with us tonight. It's not not every day we get to do a debate here, but uh, this week is going to be full of debates for the people here over at um, America First Media. Um, me today, obviously, with Destiny, and then uh, Nick tomorrow with Will, uh, Will Chamberlain uh, debating about Israel. But tonight, we're going to be talking about birth control, a very conscious... Uh, controversial i should say topic a very touchy topic for a lot of people and uh, we're gonna be talking about birth control and whether or not the government should be subsidizing it so of course i'm joined here by steve uh destiny how's it going man hey pretty good you can call me steve okay cool 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 hey so basically we got into it a little bit on twitter and uh you know as as people tend to do on twitter and we had a disagreement about whether or not the government this is essentially uh, for those of you who don't know, the backstory on this is the government uh, under the Trump administration, they decided to roll back an Obama era directive that required insurance companies to uh, cover birth control. So insurance companies and employers could could agree not to cover it if they didn't want to, uh, if, it, if it was a conscientious objection or something. And the Trump administration rolled back the directive that forced them to cover it. So people have been debating about this a lot in the, over the past couple of days and week on Twitter. Uh, what is essentially, uh, Steve, what's what's your case for why the government should be involved in this at all? And why should they be uh, forcing companies to subsidize birth control? So I guess it just seems like one of the like really rare scenarios where if we invest in something, almost every single party wins. Um, money is ultimately saved by the state. We reduce the number of abortions. We have lowered numbers of teenagers getting pregnant the health impact to women that are prescribed birth control is oftentimes very positive. Um, and it seems like the alternatives just haven't been effective in any of these areas. Like for instance, like abstinence only education. 
So I guess then my question would be, why can't a insurance company or employer, if they're then providing the birth control, if they're the ones providing the insurance, why shouldn't they be able to opt out? It seems like to me, for, for people who have religious objections, it seems like a rational uh, opportunity for them, or it, sh it should be something available to them to opt out of covering that if they object to it. I don't really, I don't buy the religious objection thing. Um, I mean, in society, our tax money goes towards supporting things that you might or may not have moral objections to. For instance, vegans are forced to pay taxes to subsidize like agriculture and whatnot. Um, you know, farm animals and shit, people that ride bikes, you know, have to pay taxes that maybe go towards, uh, you, you know, cars or the automobile industry in a roundabout way. Like, I mean, we pay people that are against wars, you know, people that might even dodge drafts or whatever, you know, their money is ultimately goes into the government for like the war fund and whatnot. So uh, the idea that like, because I have a personal religious belief, I disagree with this thing that has a measurable positive impact in almost every single way. I just don't really, I don't think that's a legitimate argument against the issue. Um, I, I feel like that opens a whole can of worms where you could be morally opposed to like a ton, like should we be able to opt out of, you know, funding the military? Is that like a thing that you... Well, we already do allow objections on certain grounds. We allow exceptions for there, there are a litany of religious exceptions in our law that have been supported by the Supreme Court and actually enshrined by the Supreme Court. For example, there was a case I, I forget the year. Uh, there were several cases, actually, where people were using drugs for uh, religious purposes and they're using uh, peyote was the drug in question. And they are allowed to do so as part of a religious uh, ceremony. There's religious exemptions to certain uh, to certain laws. And in fact, we do allow conscientious objection to military service. So we already do have this system in place where well, people who object to things on re religious lines can opt out. Yeah, but you don't you can't opt out of. Yeah. where your taxes go to right these are kind of different things like i think religious institutions can opt out of like certain types of taxes that they have to pay if they're recognized as religious but this is different than like i don't want my tax money going towards this thing right these are fundamentally different things i don't think you can like delegate like this is i want 40 percent of my tax money to go to this i don't want any percent to go to the military like we don't really do that right no i agree but what's the, t the question here is whether or not the insurance company should be able to opt out and not pay for the, the birth control or whether employers should be able to opt out of paying for birth control. And it seems like if the employer is the one paying for it, then they should have the right and the ability to tell their employees, hey, we're going to pay for this, this and this service, but we don't want to pay for birth control because we object to it. It's really not even a, a question of it's, it's not even birth control specific. If they want to say, hey, we don't want to pay for cosmetic surgery, I think they should have that same right. So I, why is it the government's job to intervene and to intervene in that relationship between the employer and the insurance company and the end user of the insurance? So I might have agreed with this um, before the ACA, but where we're being mandated now to purchase insurance on behalf of uh, ourselves, right? The government is essentially forcing us to do it. I think that the insurance companies are kind of have to fall in line in terms of what they offer for services. Also, insurance is oftentimes your access to insurance can be pretty restricted based on your job. So I'm not sure if that's um, like a positive thing, right? For instance, if you work for a company, oftentimes you only have access to their insurance if they can tell you what they will or will not cover. That can get like a, a little strange. Um, I think that in a vacuum, I'm, I'm a pretty I'm a pretty free market guy. I like minimal government mm -hmm. intervention. So in a vacuum, I can I can kind of see the idea that, well, an insurance company shouldn't be forced to provide any service that they don't necessarily want to, but I'm forced to buy insurance. I have to do it now under government mandate. So if I'm going to be forced to purchase insurance and everyone else is going to be forced to purchase insurance from you, well, now there's going to have to be some minimum things that you provide as an insurance company. If you want the, all the benefit of the entire US public being compelled to buy from you, well, now you have a minimum standard of service that you have to meet. You've almost become like a, a public service at that point, sort of. And that makes sense for for you know public entities that right it, the public the federal government when they're providing insurance plans if they are providing uh, plans on the exchanges well, no. or whatever no, no, then not they would even... be obligated to do that but but individuals who go out and choose to purchase a service or if uh, even, even better example sticking with the employer uh, model here an employer. You, you don't have a right to insurance from your employer. You don't have a right to be insured by them. So if they want to say, hey, look, we will employ you and give you insurance as a condition of your employment, there's nothing then that that they're not for, uh, forbidding you from buying other insurance, right? They're not saying you can't buy this other policy. You can still buy that policy if you want, or you can just buy the birth control over the counter for 30 bucks a month if you really want to. But there's there's nothing, there's no restrictive capacity that the employer has over you deciding where to get insurance from. They I may mean, offer a thing you don't like, but nobody's forcing you to take it. 
I don't know if I necessarily agree with that because if, if you if you have to buy insurance, right, you're forced to in the United States, or you pay a penalty that comes out to be, um, I think it's averaged out to what the average silver plan or whatever on your exchange would be, right? And also, all the insurance providers on the exchange, those aren't all federal programs, right? A lot of those are private right. insurers um, that are yeah. on that on the on the exchange on the public exchanges. If you have to buy insurance, right, and your employee offers like some type of insurance, I, I mean, like you have to buy something. I, I just I'm really uncomfortable with this idea that the companies are able to tell us that we have to for we're forced to purchase insurance from them but they can then like neg out on some things that are so positive like and I, I don't know that just seems really weird to me that um that, that you could make that argument i guess like i said i would agree with you if we weren't forced to buy insurance but since we're forced to buy some type of insurance i don't feel like they should get to pick and choose what they offer but you can just buy the insurance that offers a better thing. And and the free market will then dictate that whoever's offering the worst services, whoever's not offering birth control, for example, if that is a product in demand, the free market will then weed them out of competition and they will not receive anybody signing up for them. But that's so, not really how the free market works here, right? The, the, well, there's huge, there's because, huge failure, because, there's huge market failures insofar as insurance goes. This has been demonstrated time and time again. If you look at the history of the United States, one of the biggest market failures attached to insurance is the fact that it's it's like inelastically tied into your job, into your employment. This has been one of the biggest failures of insurance in like American history is the fact that you're tied to your employer to get insurance. Like this is something that I think should be dissuaded as much as possible. So the idea that somebody has a job somewhere and can, can throw in, and oftentimes you get cheaper insurance with your job because you're pooled together, right? If that insurance is going to be restricted and now you're forced to go buy other insurance that you can't really afford. Um, I, I don't. I don't agree that there's going to be any type of market pressure there to, to move people into doing the right thing because oftentimes people are always buying insurance with their workplace. Um, like before the ACA, for instance, how many people bought private insurance? It didn't really happen unless you were incredibly wealthy or self-employed, right? You, you pretty much always bought your work insurance because it was so much cheaper because the market just fails in, in so far as providing medical insurance. Yeah, I suppose that's still that's still true, and and I would agree with you that the ACA is. I, if you're arguing that the ACA is a problem, then I, I would agree with that. I think the solution to a lot of this stuff and where we could have a little a, a better argument that is more principled would be with the repeal of the ACA, because then mm -hmm. if you eliminate that hurdle, then you can have a totally different discussion. Where sure, and more than free market. And again, for like for market principles, I, I kind of agree with you, but I think that even morally and ethically, um, I don't know if, if it would even be these insurers that should be doing things like this, like restricting access to birth control. We can move on to like um, those types of arguments if you want as well. For me personally, I'm pro-life and I'm very um, budget conscientious. I think that budgets should be balanced when possible. So anytime the state can save money and we can reduce the number of abortions or we can reduce the number of broken families, children born out of wedlock, I think that all of those things should be advocated for and restricting birth control to to people seems to play against every single one of those points like demonstrably show like you could show that like through study after study after study so it just seems like a weird stance to take well so the that's a, a good a good topic to, to get into is because mm -hmm. I, I think that we can also separate out the financial benefits of birth control which there may be I, i'm not going to contest the idea that overall subsidizing birth control may save the state money i i think that's probably true but what could save the save the state even more money would be things like forced sterilizations or, or a mass abortion so if we want to say that that saving money is the only the only objective here then i think we get into kind of a tricky territory no because, i don't think so you know, Philosophically, we don't agree that these are the same thing, though. Philosophically, um, so I, I think I'm more in the libertarian camp in terms of philosophy goes. We want as little aggression against the individual as possible, right? Right. So when you talk about forced sterilization, this is a highly philosophically aggressive act. Could you save money on behalf of the state by doing it? Yeah, you could save money on behalf of the state by doing a lot of things that are very philosophically aggressive towards an individual. Giving somebody the access to take contraception, nobody's being compelled to take it or forced to take it. These two things are very dissimilar, I think. Right. Well, and that's, again, what I was getting to is that there are there's a difference between what is the most fiscally conservative, you could say, that will save you the most money and what is ethically and morally correct. Although there is a level of force required when you're saying that insurance companies and employers have to be forced to pay for these services that, that they may not want to, because that implies there's some kind of punishment uh, for them if they don't. So you're you're still you're just transferring where the force is, really. It's not an elimination of force to say well, that, that we're requiring insurers to pay for these things or re requiring employers to pay for these sure, things. Sure. But uh, again, I I think I can make a stronger argument for force on the side of the insurance companies because you're forcing me to buy it, right? So like if I go um, if I go march on a public street and I say I should be allowed to have freedom of speech here, right? I'm forcing you to put up with it because all of our money goes towards funding public areas. And this is why we have the right to demand that, you know, free speech and all of this can be advocated for here because we all pay for it. So again, with the insurance companies, like you the government is telling me right now that every single person in the United States has to buy insurance. If that's the case, then fine. But all of you guys now are going to have to offer what we all agree on as a society as a baseline of services if we're going to be forced to buy from you. 
know, if it was all private and companies, private companies or whatever, then you can all do whatever you want. But that's just not the case anymore. Where we're being mandated, I have to pay penalty at the end of the year for not having insurance. Like now, you, right. you know, right. Yeah, I mean, as as yeah. will I too. So, but I, I think that the the ACA wrinkle is kind of a kind of a, a red herring in this in this conversation, right? Because we're not talking about what what should be done. We're talking in a very constrained manner about the the limitations that are being placed. That you know, it sounds like that we don't even both agree with <laughs> what with what the ACA does. So, you know, I I have a an issue with that, of of course, uh, the ACA. But um, anyway, so let's let's talk more about the the birth control itself. Let's talk more about birth control um, as a product. Now, you mentioned on Twitter, and a lot of people have also mentioned on Twitter that birth control is something that is used by people not only to to act as a contraceptive, but also as a manner of uh, eliminating, you know, um, irregular periods, uh, you know, controlling uh, flow, etc, of acting as another hormonal agent. Um, now, while that is true, I think that there are other alternatives that can be used there that don't necessarily require um, they don't they don't require employers or insurance companies to pay for and to subsidize birth control, which they still may find morally objectionable. So I don't see birth control as the only option in these cases, that, because in fact there are, are many options that work even better than, well, than the birth control. But that's not true. And why does your opinion there matter? Um, like birth well, control is well, I mean, well, no, no, that's but no, that's not the medical community's opinion, right? For PCOS, for the polycystic ovarian syndrome, mm -hmm. um, birth control is the leading lead prescribed thing. For things like um, issues with irregular periods, acne, uh, menstrual cramps, things like that, birth control is the leading prescribed thing. Like in the medical community, that's that that is the most often prescribed thing to to deal with these issues. So, I mean, you might think that there are other um, ways to deal with it and that's fine but that's not what the medical community thinks why would why would anybody adhere to the opinions of some people with a moral objection from on medical grounds that seems like a strange well no there are side effects though there, there are are alternatives to treat those things the pcos I, I agree with you the birth control is the best way to treat it but the other hormonal irregular irregularities for example there are other ways to treat that that don't have the same side effects as birth control uh, birth control is associated with things like weight gain it's associated with uh, depression there are a, a lot of links that that uh, are not often publicized that birth control can actually have very detrimental health effects well so and everything is publicized birth control is very heavily studied in the u.s the idea that there are secret side effects right. that aren't publicized publicized is not true right no but it's not talked about it's it's not it's not put I'm out sure there. it's talked about of course if you're a woman and you go and you talk to your OBGYN they're gonna give you this is why there are different types of birth controls available not everybody mm -hmm. is on oral contraceptives some people get an IUD some people go low hormone some people this is why I, um, I kind of railed you when you tweeted out that nine dollar generic crap and you said look birth control is only nine dollars um, birth control is very very unique to every oh. single woman this is why you have a conversation with your caretaker and you decide which birth control is best for you oftentimes women will, will switch between oral contraceptives one may not work as well as another a generic brand might not have have the same inactives that, that affect you in a different way that the name brand will, right? Um, there are tons of different types of birth control. Are there side effects to some? Of course, but these aren't secret. And even though the side effects exist, doctors still are leading, recommending the birth controls for things like PCOS and other types of period problems because it's very easily accessible. It has a very low impact. There are some side effects, but it's nowhere near as severe as more invasive operations or whatever. Yeah, and, and and that's that's all true. But again, that's not answering the question of why the employer should have to should be forced to, to pay for it, which I guess we did already kind of address. So yeah, no, that's 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 all true. And and there there are you know of course medical benefits to to taking these things. But I think we also have to acknowledge that there are a lot of risks um, as well. There are the the you know the associated weight gain. This is there are studies from University of Texas that say that uh, birth control leads to significant weight gain and changes in body mass. Uh, again, these studies about uh, depression, for example. Um, yeah, so I'm, so I'm familiar. I'm familiar with it. I think it's a 2007 Texas study report. I'm, I'm familiar with the one you're talking about. Um, yeah. One of the problems is that some types of birth control. First of all, I think that only applied to the injection DM mm -hmm. uh, DMPA or something that only applied to one specific type of birth control. Firstly, secondly, it didn't impact every single woman. It was just a percentage of them. And then third. Thirdly, this just highlights the importance of women having conversations with their practitioners about what birth control is the most effective option for them. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, healthcare should not be you know standardized in my opinion. I don't think everyone should should be receiving the same treatment. Well, no, but you're on the argument right now where you're saying that one whole branch of like healthcare should be axed off because some people have a moral objection to it, even though we're all morally compelled or we're all by law compelled to pay for it. 
No, I'm not saying it should be axed off, but I'm saying that it should not be, no one should be forced to pay for it. I think forcing people to subsidize this thing that there may be moral objections to is is where uh, I run into problems with it. Sure, but when, uh, you, there, when you force people, when you, when you say we're not going to subsidize this particular type of medical treatment, you're making it unavailable to the people that need it most and to the people that hurt our state the most, right? The people that need the birth control the most are the ones that end up having children out of wedlock that we have to ultimately pay for, right? Via welfare and other forms of subsidies. We don't, we don't have to ultimately pay for it. We could well, in today's society, there's no way we're way past the point of rolling back those laws, right? And ultimately, we, we don't want these things anyway. We don't want single parent households, right? Um, there is a really interesting study in Chile where a bunch of, um, I think this happened about 15 years ago, where a bunch of companies colluded together and there was a huge spike in, uh, a huge spike in birth control in, in like one day. Like this happened like immediately. And the really interesting thing is that the people could study it as kind of like an experiment and they, and they followed like 20 years after to see what happened to all the children. And in that one week, pregnancies increased by 4%. And the amount of um, pregnancies that increased were among all of the worst people in society to be getting pregnant. The people that had very high credit card debt, the people that were single, um, that went on to have broken families. And you could follow these children. Um, they had worse um, results in school compared to the control groups. They had um, worse households. Oftentimes, they were single parent households. Um, a lot of them had special special education um, that were overrepresented compared to the main group because the um, status of the mother during pregnancy can have an impact on the birth of the child. Like, it just seems like a, a really bad thing to cut off birth control. To, to, to the groups of people that need it the most. Like, I know that you say you're not getting rid of it completely, but effectively, you kind of are, right? When the poorest people can't afford it anymore? Well, I would contest that you're not, that there, there is no group of people that really needs it. And, and I think that when you, uh, in fact, increase the supply of birth control, you make birth control more accessible, what you end up doing is you end up enabling more uh, sexual degeneracy. So and that's not true either, though, unfortunately, is that when you look at the studies for the difference, so there's four different breakdowns of this. You've got eight hour, there's a big study, you've got eight hour comprehensive um, sex ed, you've got 12 hour comprehensive sex ed, you've got abstinence only, and then you've got safe sex only. That when you look at these groups, almost none of the abstinence only kids delay their first sexual interaction anymore. Almost none of them have a, a different number of partners. Like kids still have sex. And I mean, we know this. I I hate to say anecdotally, but we know this anecdotally, like kids that are 17, 18 are going to fuck. There's no way that any type of program, uh, you know, is going to keep them from having sex. It just doesn't happen with teenagers. This is why some of the leading spokespeople like Sarah Palin have daughters that have multiple children, like out of wedlock. Like the abstinence only education is like a demonstrative, right. like it's demonstrated to fail over and over and but over I'm, again. I'm not advocating for abstinence only education. What what I'm saying is that when you enable people uh, through government subsidy, in this case, by, by subsidizing birth control, when you enable them to engage in more sexual degeneracy, which is which is what happens in more more sexual partners and we're seeing this uh the studies to back this up that between the uh, 1980s and the pill first became really prevalently used in the late 70s and 80s um up until now from the 80s up until now the the amount of sex that these uh young kids are having is is increasing and you know I'm not trying to be a, a moral purist here and say, you know, uh, sex before marriage is I'm not trying to make like a religious or, or moral argument about that, but it leads to increased risks. It, it leads to increased uh, risks and it leads to a inability to form uh, long term relationships, which is something we see backed up uh, by several studies where they say that the um, amount of sexual partners that you have before marriage impacts negatively. The, the uh, there's a correlation between divorce rates and the amount of people, amount of partners people have before marriage. So, yeah, of course. And that's something that that should be looked into, I agree. Although there are a lot of, you have to be careful how you word a lot of that too, because there are a lot of religious women that will stay in marriages for a long time or never divorce because of shame to their family or because they think they can only have one partner. Or if you're Catholic, you have to go to the church and get an actual annulment of your marriage in order to be remarried in the church. So you could argue that people getting divorced is actually people exercising their freedom of choice, right? And again, as a libertarian, I understand philosophically we might be different here. I don't know what your foundation is, but I'm usually on the side where I advocate for individuals being able to make the choices that they feel are, are the best. So if, if providing something enables people to, to make more choices concerning their personal freedom, I, I have a really hard time arguing about that. If you're, if you're trying to make the argument that like we should limit contraception so that teens can't choose to have sex more, well, if a person wants to choose to engage in sexual behavior, that should be their, their freedom of choice. This is the United States. You should have the right to do that. But we should we shouldn't be subsidizing the degeneracy. I think is really what the point is, and we shouldn't be subsidizing people to make bad decisions. But this is and you know the, the choices may be good for the individual, and and the the idea that uh, the world revolves around the individual is something that I know you know as someone who is formerly libertarian, uh, focusing on the individual rights and individual um, abilities to to do what you choose. I know that's a big thing among libertarians, but 
the thing that is not often considered among libertarians, the thing I think I think we should be considering um, as as uh, you know an American uh, governmental body here is what is good for society, what's good for the the greater good in society. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that enabling more kids to be uh, sexually experimental or enabling people to have uh, six to nine, I mean, um, you know, ten plus is really where the the increase starts among sex partners impacting marriage. I don't think enabling that choice is a good thing i think that by enabling that choice we are then you know granting people the ability to personally uh you know have the personal fun or or satisfaction um and that's that's fine but we're also leading to the the breakdown of the societal structures that are the underpinning of our society so i can't speak to breaking down of fundamental structures because i haven't seen that demonstrated in any way i can tell you that there are structures that break down as a result of children being born out of wedlock and it's very easy to demonstrate from a pragmatic point of view you started off that that or you started off that sentence with we shouldn't be subsidizing this but we are so if you don't want to pay for birth control for a woman today then tomorrow you have to pay for a bigger police force to lock up a kid that's born to a single parent household that's going to be more predisposed to crime you might have to pay for right because because people born into, right. into single households have it's one of the leading indicators of whether or not you'll be a criminal. You're going to have to pay well, for, yeah, for government assistance well. programs. Sure, yeah. racially, but black people also have a huge issue with single-parent households, which can be fixed mm -hmm. with better access to contraceptions, right? So... Um, you but also it hasn't, have, I mean, it, it, that, that's just simply not true because we've increased access to contraception uh, greatly over the past 30 years, mm -hmm. and the out-of-wedlock birth rate continues to go up. No, that's so absolutely not true. Um, according to a 2014 National Vital Statistics report, teen pregnancies fall on 57 percent between 91 yeah, not, and 20. That's not the statistic. That's not this uh, statistic I'm talking about. I'm talking about African American out of wedlock birth, which is what you were talking about. And that statistic hasn't that that rate has in fact gone up in the past 30 years. Okay, I, I mean, I would have to. I mean, you could argue that these are people that are economically disenfranchised the most and need the most access to these types of um, medications. I, I don't know what the specific African American birth rate is, but I don't think their bodies are impervious to contraception any more than white people are. And I know that the right, global rate. Access, increasing access hasn't fixed it. Increasing ha access has hasn't, access hasn't been fixed. adequately increased. What is the stat for that? That African American? I'm just curious. Where did that come from? I'll look it up, but it's it's real. I'll find it. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot or anything, but I, I know that all of the um, national averages have fallen greatly um, since the, since birth control has been made available. And that if you look at, I know mean, there's a study in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 2006, the, resu um, the results suggest that legal access to the pill before age 21 significantly reduced the likelihood of first birth before age 22, increased the number of women in the paid labor force, and raised the number of annual hours worked. Access to the pill before the age of 21 reduced the likelihood of being a mother before the age of 22 by 14 to 18 percent. And it increased employment as well. So, I, I mean, I don't have, I, I guess I didn't look for specific impacts on the black community. Um, I, I guess depending on where you live and, and what kind of access you have, it, it maybe these people still don't have access to, to these types of birth controls. But in every other area where birth control, um, California and Colorado both have massive, um, they have state funded birth control or, or contraception programs that, that give contraception to people that are that need the most. So people are in poverty, lower um, wage class people. And some of the cost savings here are like insane. Like for every $1 spent on certain types of contraception, $7 is saved on behalf of the state, right? That would go on to be spent on like WIC or, or other types of welfare, EIC, whatever, that would go back towards families. So like, um, I don't know. It just seems like the, the, the money savings part and the overall impact, it, it seems to be pretty obvious. But it's not addressing the problem. And, and those those studies can work in a vacuum and those those decisions can work in a vacuum. Sure. But again, the the rates of if we're, what we're really trying to address, here, if we're really trying to address the uh, broken families and out of wedlock births and uh, teen pregnancy, et cetera. We're not addressing it, and, and increases to access and contraception aren't addressing it because uh, now, as of um, I believe this is 2012, um, 73 percent of non-Hispanic blacks uh, have birth rates out of wedlock, and so again, this has coincided with the increase in access to birth control. Birth control uh, prices now are lower than they ever have been. You know, we saw people on on Twitter saying, "Oh, my birth control costs 30 bucks a month." Okay, well, 30 bucks a month is not that much money. So it, it, even well, if you're paying that out of pocket, it's not that much to you. But not every birth control is 30 dollars a month, and to some people, 30 dollars a month can be prohibitive. I mean, it depends on what's going on. Okay, well, every every clinic has free condoms, and you know, ultimately, not having sex costs nothing. So if you're really if you're really in a low income situation and you're concerned about not having a, a child, uh, you can just choose to not have sex. And sure, that's, and if you're in a low income fine. situation, you don't make much money. You can also choose to start your own business and become wildly successful. I mean, we can look at the decisions that people make in real life, and then we can 
look at those. I, I, I mean, I don't. Th this argument, like you can just choose to not have sex, just doesn't seem to have worked at any point in human history, at any point in the planet. So I don't know why that argument just doesn't seem to hold any merit to me. Like, just tell people not to have sex. If anything, people that are in lower income situations with less access to entertainment and social activities seem to be engaging in sex the most because it's one of the only forms of yeah. recreation they have. So, so the idea that you right. can just say don't have sex just doesn't seem to make very much sense to me. Um, you point to the fact well, that. Wait a second. So no, go ahead. Sorry. Maybe I was going to say you point to the fact that black people um, are, are still fucked in terms of family situation, and that might be true. But the but the national birth rate has fallen as contraception has become more available. So that seems to point to some sort of issue more specific to those communities than just saying that contraception has failed. When every single study seems to herald the effects of contraception on out of wedlock pregnancy, on teen pregnancy, on women delaying their first child, on women participating in the labor force. Well, then again, then again, you're you're conflating two things. You're talking about the the national overall birth rate uh -huh. and and equating that to teen pregnancy. That's not entirely true. I mean, a lot of the reason that people have stopped having kids and the birth rates are so low is because the the uh, economic situation is that women have to work more now. Women have to be in the workforce more now, and so there's less time to rear children. Also, it's more expensive to have a kid if you're in the middle class. Uh, you know, if if you are poor in America, it's actually cheaper to have a child than it is if you're in the middle class because you'll get more in subsidies for doing so. And I think that's the problem that a lot of people aren't talking about. And you, coming from a libertarian background, it seems like you could uh, possibly agree with part of this. That part of the reason that we have such a problem with out of wedlock birth is that people know their kids will be taken care of. People know that the government will come in with with money to take care of their children. And I think that we could go a long way towards reducing the out of wedlock birth problem if we simply cut off the subsidies and said, hey, we're not going to feed your kids if you have kids uh, you know, that you can't take care of. I think that would go a long way towards solving the problem. But, I, but uh, birth, birth control and things like that just seem to me to be window dressing over the, the real problem, which is personal responsibility. Um, okay, so for the first... For the second part, I don't, I don't think we're ever just going to cut off funding to, to impoverish people and say you, you can starve if you fuck up. I don't think that's ever going to happen. You agree with that realistically. Whether or not you like it, that's probably nothing that's ever going to happen, right? I don't know. I mean, societies in the past have done it, and they've they've instituted policies that uh, restrict uh, the access to to having children. In fact, the U.S. has done it with uh, with Buck, B, Buck v. Bell back in the 1920s, where we had policies that if you were the child of if you were the the, the grandchild of a felon and your father was a felon, I think it was or no, it, it was some sort of testing that they they used, and they said, well, if you have three generations of people who are just not fitting in in society, you get sterilized, and that worked to uh, you know great effect. California was actually one of the the leading frontiers for. Or, uh, you know, sterilization policies worldwide. So I, we've done it before in the U.S. and it, it yeah, has so worked to... the fact that you have to go back to 100 back. years to find an example of us doing this, I feel like this is probably something that's not going to happen anytime soon in the United States. So it doesn't really seem... I don't think we're ever cutting off welfare to every single poor person in the United States if well, they have children. I mean, that, that's a current year argument. That's not addressing whether it's right or wrong. It's just addressing the, the poss possibility of it happening. Sure. I, I guess when I when I try to root these arguments, I try to think of it pragmatically, like what what the way forward, what is the successful way going forward? And the idea that we're going to somehow roll back every single welfare program that exists to mothers that have children. I mean, aside from the, the moral arguments against this, it just seems like that's not really worth considering that much because I just don't see that happening anytime soon. I guess it could since it did once for a specific situation in the 1920s related to felons, but... It just doesn't seem like something that's worth discussing. You're, you're limiting yourself. Have some imagination here. We're we're trying to come up with the best yeah. solutions, not uh, not limit ourselves with boring pragmatism. Well, yeah, but I I, I guess I prefer the pragmatism <laughs> to American fanfics. But um, it, it, so the, well, another thing you said well, is that other countries have done it. I mean, other what? countries throughout the world have done this to great effect as well. Um. Possibly. I can't speak to other countries. I'm an American and I prefer the values of the United States. I'm sure there are other states that have different, you know, values around the world, but I prefer this one. Um, so I can't really speak to those. I know that in Chile, when they when that price collusion happened, I know that even poor people had a fuck ton of children. I mean, these are things that you have to deal with in one way or another. Even if you do cut off subsidies, you're probably just going to increase the crime rate at that point, or you're going to increase the burden on, on family members or other people or other social systems. Like somewhere is going to suffer, right? You're not just going to have hundreds of thousands of poor people dead in the streets. Like this isn't a realistic way forward. Right, something is going to be tested or strained here at some point. That's going to demand the attention of, of the government in some way. And usually, addressing the problems earlier is cheaper than waiting until you've got piles of dead children on the street uh, because you've decided to cut off all welfare spending. Yeah, but it, I mean, it seems like we're just continuing to to find ways to you know put new wallpaper over the collapsing walls. Like like we're not addressing what these these root problems are. And, and well, but the, but we uh, are increasing but, access to. 
contraception well, no, does. Not, we we can demonstrate, right? Or, or at least economists at Harvard, um, people that run data for the National Vital Statistics, people that report data for the CDC, all seem to agree that oral contraception has provided a massive reduction in the number of teenage pregnancies, even controlling for things like the falling birth rate compared to other people that don't use contraception. It's not like every single teen is taking contraceptives and they would have decided not to have children anyway. Like um, th these things are, are definitely linked and probably to a, a causal degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and while you're doing that, you're also enabling, again, you're, you're enabling people to engage in more and more, uh, you know, rootless, uh, meaningless, sexual. These are activity, all value which... statements of your personal morals that I don't really care about. And I don't think anybody in the United States deserves to have your personal morals asserted onto them in terms of public right. funding. But we can observe that these things have a negative impact on people negative, in the long term. Negative for you. You say that a divorce is negative. Maybe it's not really that negative. I don't know. Maybe that's a big religion. You just said that broken, fa you just said that broken families and children growing up in, uh, in broken families was a negative thing. So, I, in fact, I think we both agree on these. A divorce doesn't always here. imply a family. You can get divorced from somebody without having a child. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yes, you can. But the point here being that people who uh, have children and then get divorced, that is then a broken family. And, and but the, have the number in... of broken families increased in the United States? I, I don't I haven't seen that number anywhere. The number of single parent families, it seems to have decreased in most communities outside of the black community is facing a, a problem pretty unique to them. Although I think even they had one, um, they had it falling a little bit. But I, I mean, two people I don't believe that's true. In fact, I think it has increased. The number of uh, single parents has increased in the U.S. I hate to. I, 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 I'll find that statistic because I'm genuinely curious. You may be right, but I, I think it has increased. Okay. Because, like, if, if some people get divorced, that's a lot different than, like, would you agree that if two people were in their 20s or 30s and they got divorced and they had a child, that's a much different situation than somebody who's 14 getting pregnant and having a child, right? That, that one, one child is going to be, I'm broken up with my child's mom, but my child goes back and forth between our houses. Both of us are financially well off. He sees both parents. He goes to a good school, right? That my child is in a fundamentally different spot than somebody who's 16 and has a kid and has no no money, no connection with the father, no support structure, right? That these are fundamentally different yeah, situations. Yeah, they're different. Sure. Yeah, yeah, so different. I, I don't think these are the, the same comparison that's saying just because divorce is increased because we have more sex, which is something that's happening anyway, regardless of whether or not you have contraception, means that we need to get rid of contraception. When you can't demonstrate anywhere in the United States that the, that getting rid of contraception keeps people from having st um, sex. If you look at like all the highest like teen pregnancy rates, you go to all the southern states, Texas, Georgia, like all of these states are like leading the boards in terms of child pregnancy. It seems like that approach doesn't work. And even if you even if you personally believe that it is sexual degeneracy for these people to run around and be fucking each other, you can still advocate against that all you want while still making contraception available. There are plenty of women that are on contraception that don't have sex before marriage because they use it for health benefits or to regulate their periods or anything else. Right. So since I, I just found the stat, since uh, 1990 is the latest, uh, the furthest this goes back. Um, this is from PRB.org, which is a uh, population reference bureau. Uh, 1990, the percent of children in single parent families was 25 percent. And in 1998, it was uh, 29 percent. So it's, it's a 4% increase over eight years. And in the year 2000, this is this is kind of old data, but it was uh, at 28 uh, percent. So there has been a marginal increase in the amount of people in children living in single parent families, which then when you look at the rising divorce rate or the divorce rates that were rising at the time and the rates of out of wedlock birth you can say that this is leading to more and more uh, broken families now you know you, you can of course make the correlation causation argument and say that well the increase in birth control uh you know show me the stats that link that directly to the increase in in uh, uh divorce etc and I, that's a, a fair point to make but i don't think anybody can can deny that the increase in access to birth control enables these more risky behaviors because it enables people to to engage in the behaviors without consequence so, now the abstinence only education again we're, we're talking about southern states that is you have to look at the demographics of those states as well because there are uh, disproportionately about 30 percent in a lot of southern states 30 to 40 percent uh, african-american which they we see across the united states they have more teen pregnancies regardless so it would only make sense that when you increase the population and percentage of african-americans in a certain region that region will have more out of wedlock birth it'll have more more teen pregnancy because that's something that we see uh, across the whole U.S. So I, I, I don't... I, I, I don't think it's it's possible to entirely dismiss the, correla the 
correlation here. So the problem is the the, the um, I understand what the, I understand what you're saying, but the numbers just don't exist to back that up, right? That in every study, um, the Journal of Adolescent Health publishes a lot of studies about um, comparative analysis between people that receive different forms of sex education, and these studies that people that get abstinence only education um, don't have as much sex as other kids. These studies just don't exist. All the data shows the opposite. That the amount of children that have engaged in sexual activity is about the same no matter what. Like whether they have the whether they have super comprehensive um, sex ed, which includes abstinence only and contraceptions, whether they have safe sex only education, or whether they have abstinence only education or no sexual education, it seems like they, they engage in sexual activity about the same rates. There's not this huge variance. And this is an argument that I hear pushed forward kind of a lot by people that try to like moral crusade on this, that like, well, if we if we give them condoms, they're, they're going to have sex more. But it seems like they do, regardless of whether or not they have access to contraception or learned about it. The only difference is how many of them get pregnant, which ultimately is what I'm concerned about, because that's what I have to pay for at the end of the day. And that's what leads to real corruption in the United States in the day. You might be mad that um, people have sex more or, or, or that might bother you, the degeneracy, but things like crime rates, things like burden on the state, things like um, labor force participation, things like economic value, like these are things that mm -hmm. I think um, will these are things that concern everybody, regardless of your moral position, uh, unless you're like some extreme nihilist, hedonist or something, right? Every single person in the United States is concerned about the number of criminals on the street. Every single person sure. in the U.S. is concerned about how much of their federal income tax is going towards entitlements and welfare. Every single person in the United States is concerned about, um, you know, like the size of their police force and how much money has to go into you know, all these other programs. Like these are things that concern everybody. Um, the idea that um, a handful of people want a moral crusade against children having sex for some reason and then can't even demonstrate data that shows that keeping them from contraceptives even helps. Um, I don't think that's a really strong argument in, in opposition to making oral contraception or any kind of contraception available to these people. Well, again, you're, con you're conflating abstinence-only education, which is not what I'm pushing, with the actual consumption of the birth control. That's, I mean, that, those well, are two totally different what's things. What's the alternative to availability of contraceptive versus not having sex? Well, no, I mean, you're talking about one is an educational philosophy and one uh -huh. is a government policy where you're subsidizing access to these things. I, they're, they're fundamentally different. Well, and no, they're, the fun, way, they're fundamentally... Way, I, would, oh, sorry, I would completely concede your point on abstinence-only education, which is why I don't support abstinence-only education. And it, it has been demonstrated, uh, you know, not to work in many cases. So I, I, I don't have any objection to that point. Um, but if, wait, if wait, we're wait, wait, talk about... Well, just because this is a confusing stance to me, because um, subsidization happens for schools, right? Our property subsidize school education. So sex education mm -hmm. is, by extension of that, kind of subsidized. Why would you be in favor of teaching people in schools how to properly use contraception, but then be opposed to providing the contraception that you're already paying for them to learn how to use because it's it's a risk management i mean by by doing the uh educate birth sorry by by pro providing such a, a sex education you are doing a sort of risk management there you are giving you're teaching people how to use these things but that is not the same as saying we need to pay for it i mean this this is like you know teaching uh, teaching anything and then not having to pay for it it's it's not really a uh, contradiction at all well but the you risk management is higher on your end than it is on my end. On my end, I can demonstrate that for every dollar I spend on contraception, I'm saving multiple dollars at the end of the day. So it seems much less risky for me to pay for contraceptions or contraceptive availability to poor people than it is for you to risk not paying for it and then to, I think as you said, just tell them to stop having sex. That seems like a much riskier proposition that at the end of the day deals significant damage to society compared to just having a few more sexual deviants running around. But it, the problem is we're not just having a few more sexual deviants running around. We are we are wholesale enabling people by providing their birth control, by subsidizing the, their birth control as a state. We are enabling them to engage in this behavior that has a long term detrimental behavior. It has a okay. long term detrimental effect on society. So you keep saying we're enabling a behavior. This behavior is enabled no matter what. It's going to happen regardless. This is like saying by putting seatbelts in cars, we're enabling people to get into more car accidents. Car accidents happen regardless of whether or not the safety belt is available. But we have it there to reduce the number of people killed during car accidents. This idea that making contraceptives contraception more available causes more people to have sex. It's just not in the numbers anyway. It's just not demonstrated anywhere. Well, it is because, again, once the birth control, once uh, oral birth control became more available in the late 70s and early 80s, that's when we started to see the rise in people having uh, casual sexual encounters. And so, this has been demonstrated in multiple studies. But but it hasn't been. This is a correlation. Like the sexual revolution of women and feminism has caused a whole bunch of stuff sexually to change in the United States. People get, for instance, one of the leading ways you measure that is sex before marriage. People used to get married much, much, much earlier, 18, 19, sometimes mm -hmm. right out of high school, people get married. That age has been put off dramatically so. So now somebody could have sex um, 40 years ago at 18, and that would be considered 
considered married sex, now somebody can have sex at 24, 25, and they've, not, they've never mm -hmm. been married yet, right? So now our premarital sex mm -hmm. rates are climbing. Um, right, so and, and that's, that's a bad statistic to use, but what you can look at is the rise in people's uh, social attitudes towards premarital sex, and that is, I had that up here somewhere, uh, where people who, when, when they do the polling, mm -hmm. they are, are more accepting of it nowadays. Sure. So this kind of we can bring this back then into a kind of a, a philosophical discussion, if you want, about whether or not people should have sex before marriage. Um, but again, we're, we're pushing these are very, very personal moral views now that we're pushing after abdicating the platform that we have any grounds to stand on financially. Right. Because you're, you're essentially saying, OK, well, maybe the state will lose money. Maybe we'll mm -hmm. have more out of wedlock birth. Maybe um, more teenagers will get pregnant um, and maybe we'll have a bunch of healthies for, for women. But I have this philosophical belief. Right. Like, well, I mean, fuck, like Muslims use that in countries to, to, to justify fucked up shit all the time. Like that just seems like a really crazy, <laughs> archaic stance to take. Like that seems like a hyper conservative. Like I have a belief personally that's bad for society on every measurable level. But I feel really strongly about this thing. So I think I should be able to compel everybody else to do it financially. Right, but it's not measurable for for society. It's not bad. It's not bad for society on every measurable level. It is. It, I, I'm completely conceding that there may be financial risks and it may be more expensive. Absolutely, but we have to look at what the the overall effect on society is. And when you look at the the ability or the uh, enabling of these things, these broken homes and these these divorces and people, you know, having kids and then and then breaking up and there are, is less, uh, you know, risk attached to sex now. That then. I think that prevents or uh, presents so many more externalities than just these simple uh, birth rates do. There are then uh, simple, you know, teen pregnancies do. Yeah, I think so, there are I mean, so many more externalities that lead to uh, much worse things happening in society uh, with that. So I would rather lose the money is what I'm saying. Sure, I'd rather that, lose but, the money. But that might be true, but that has to be demonstrated. Then you're going to have to show some sort of long term study that shows that even though. So like here would be an example study, even though the teenage birth rate was so much lower, um, the amount of economic harm caused by this by people not getting married or something like ended up over um shadowing the, the money saved on not having teenage pregnancies or whatever right like the problem is that like right. I, I can demonstrate like in very clear ways like teenage pregnancy has fallen dramatically most people agree that like the the cdc vital statistics um harvard publishers like people agree that um that that the birth control has contributed greatly to the to the pregnancy rates falling amongst teens and then your counter to that is well but people having more sex is kind of bad and a lot of these kind of more externality ways like well this can be measured you can measure these things and there are people that do studies to measure these things but you would have to have this measured so that you can actually present like a legitimate argument in the face of you know 14 to 18 percent decrease in teenage pregnancy rates this is something that i can demonstrate that everybody agrees is good and all the externalities mm -hmm. of that everybody agrees is good lower crime lower burden on the state better ac uh, better economic opportunity for women better health outcomes for women like these are all things things that are better that, that I can show yeah, like no, very I, clearly. I don't, I don't disagree with any of that. But again, mm -hmm. what you're you're consistently avoiding here is the fact that this is uh, from the Institute of Family Studies here, a uh, study from 2002 to 2013, where they find that the increase in amount of sexual partners decreases the permanence of someone's marriage. And we look at the the data. Yes, that, but so uh, like we can talk about that, that specifically. I don't care. Like. Um, maybe marriage is something that doesn't work necessarily in society anymore. Maybe it does. Maybe we need to change our attitudes on that. But like, if if I can give up teenage pregnancy, if if we're at a, if we're at a trading table, okay, if I'm Trump and I'm going to give up teenage pregnancy, higher crime rates, higher burden on the state, federally and state budgets, right? Higher um, out of, out of wedlock children, right? And I can trade that mm -hmm. for more people getting divorced. I'll take that trade every day of the week. Like that's an easy trade. Also, right, marriage is it, also it, highly linked to economic opportunity as well, and a faltering middle class has been contributing to lower marriage rates as well well not necessarily just the the birth control stuff but that could be a plausible explanation for why marriage rates have fallen too yeah and we could uh, improve the middle class situation by spending less money on welfare for people who have too many kids and, and things like that but uh, the it's not just marriage right you you're uh trying to condense down all of the benefits to to a, a strong marriage right and a strong institution of marriage in the uh, national context you're trying to condense that down just to marriage but marriage goes beyond that marriage provides so many more benefits for society like for example raising children in a two-parent household which is uh, according to every single metric better for the kid it, it pr uh, leads to smarter kids higher iq children it leads to more future economic opportunity for the children there have been a litany of studies that are demonstrating this and and nobody seriously can that children who are raised in single parent households are just as well off as kids who are raised in two parent households. Everyone agrees to this. Every every sociologist, every expert agrees to this. Okay, mm -hmm. and so so 
we can't just sum it down to oh it's just marriage that is being taken away in exchange for these other these other uh this well, like, sexual deviance and these other benefits so that's because something... it, it affects it affects our future generations more than than we like to think about sure and that's something that would be addressed or, or I, I imagine you would want to address but that doesn't get rid of everything else everything else for birth control like even if there are some more people that are being and that's why it's a debate that's, that's why that's why it's a value judgment well but it's not a value judgment because your value judgment is that there might be some people that are more likely to be in single parent households because more people get divorced Divorced, but I can point to absolute concrete numbers for teenage pregnancy that are much more detrimental than, than somebody in their 20s and 30s, right? Not all single parent households are the same. And, and single parent households wouldn't be as great, of a, as great at a disadvantage against dual parent households if all else was equal as well, right? I, again, my child lives in a single parent household, kind of, right? His mom and I get along, but we trade the kid, but I'm very wealthy. He goes to a very wealthy school. He's got all of his clothes. Everything is fine for him. He's in a much different situation than somebody that's 16 and gets pregnant. So the idea that you can equivocate these two things that, well, there are some people that that live in broken households now because some some people are getting divorced like i just don't think that holds very much water compared to you lowering do, like the teenage birth rate you do understand that you are an extreme anecdote and your situation is ex is an extreme positive anecdote mm -hmm. uh as compared to the rest of the single parent no i don't uh, even agree with that i think i think mine is a negative anecdote my child would be better off if he was in a dual parent household if me and the mother were still together he'd be better off i'm just right. saying nope. that you're, when you say single parent household the reason why a single parent household you said earlier that all psychologists and sociologists agree that dual learner dual parent households is better than single parent that's absolutely true but that's also because a lot of single parent households are super fucked and one thing that contributes to that super fuckness is teens getting pregnant that if every single parent household was like mine it probably wouldn't be that big of a deal i'm sure it would still be worse than being in a dual parent household but if every single parent household was a working mother a working father that has a kid and they they work together and they got pregnant in their mid-20s instead of their mid-teens single parent households probably wouldn't be as huge of a deal or as huge of a leading indicator as crime as they are right now compared to kids getting pregnant in school like in high school and grade school right well yeah and i that I, the kids should not be getting pregnant in, in grade school uh, at all definitely no wh what i meant by when i said it, your example is a is a positive is that it, as compared to other single parent households as sure. compared to other single parent well, also households, because I'm sure i didn't your get median income and your and your uh, availability and your kids are much better off than the people most people who are having children in single parent households sure but but you can agree then that kids that are born to single parent households when when that parent is in their mid or late 20s are going to be a lot better off than teens getting pregnant right Possibly. It depends on the, the dynamics. Yeah, no, it, it does. I mean, it depends on how, yeah, on average. Yes, you probably could. Okay. Yeah. So, so even right. if we have a small bump in, in child, um, in, in single parent households later in life, that's an easy trade off compared to a, a 10 to 15% decrease in teen pregnancies, right? If there's, if there's a small, what did you say? 4% increase or whatever in, in single parent households later on in, in life, I would gladly, gladly trade that for, for 15% of an increase in teen pregnancy. That's an easy trade. Right, it, and well, that's only a four percent increase over over eight years. We don't know how how big that uh, increase is. I'm I'm trying to find that statistic, mm -hmm. sure, uh, because that and again, I, a better picture. And I agree that that's a bad thing too. But I still think that's something that we could combat. It. We can combat that. We can talk about that socially. We can try to enact programs to do it. But getting rid of birth control just doesn't seem to be the way to do this, right? That when when I like because I was trying to find this because I you know you go into the scholar Google and you try to find like birth control um, impact, um, you know, child rates or whatever or, or, or pregnancy rates. You just can't. Find find these numbers every study says the same thing that teens to and again anecdotally most of us know this to be true that and i even went to a private school i even went to a catholic school that teens fuck when they hit 15 16 17 it's just what they do it's what kids have always done throughout all of <laughs> modern history the only difference is that it used to be that they were fucking at 15 16 17 but they were married at 15 16 17 and now we don't get married we're getting married later and later and later in life right that people um the, the marriage rates for the united states have been pushed back farther than they ever have in human history so of course you're gonna have more premarital sex because the the age at which we start fucking is about the same as it always has been. Sure. Yeah. And and as marriage gets put, you know pushed off later, of course, mm -hmm. the amount of premarital sex will increase. Um, the issue is, though, we're not just subsidizing kids who are teenagers to to be taking birth control. We're mm -hmm. subsidizing birth control for people into their late into their 20s and 30s. And they then end up, uh, you know, living, living on birth control. Right. And they, they end up never having children. They end up never, never, uh, oftentimes never getting married and and living that single lifestyle for forever. And I don't think that's something we should be subsidizing. I don't think that's something we should be enabling. Uh, if we were to talk about a program where 
where, where kids, you know, you have access to birth control between the ages, maybe of, of 15 and, and 22 or something. That, that is a lot more appealing to me than just providing this for women uh, ad infinitum, you know, providing it forever. Because I, I think the government policies and the policies we, we have as a government should serve the best interest of the people. And, and, Enabling people to never have children is, I don't think, a, a positive thing for uh, for society. I guess, but again, this we would have to go back to room on, on philosophy. Like I would always argue that enabling a person to make individual choices to the best of their ability about their their childbearing status is always going to be superior to the government through economic or fiscal policies um, getting people to have children. So, like, if the argument was ever that, like, well, if we stop providing birth control to people in their thirties, more of them will accidentally get pregnant. Well, that's not something that I would ever be philosophically in favor of, of saying. Right, but that's I guess that comes down to individualism versus versus a uh, more you know collectivist ideology. Sure, and, but then again, we also we, have to be careful because you keep careful about using the using the term force because uh -huh. you're you're saying we don't want to economically force or or institute any other type of force to uh, force people to have children. Right, mm -hmm. fine, I, I I would agree with that. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we need to be enabling people to live lifestyles and to engage in uh, sexual promiscuity and engage in lifestyles where they don't have children. We could be with the government should be, in my opinion, a neutral party on this, and it should yeah, not but, be subsidizing one way. The sure. other. But a neutral party means offering the choice to the person, right? If right now, the government is a neutral party. For it to be not neutral, they would have to force you. They would have to compel you to take birth control. And I would be uh, just as philosophically opposed to that. If a woman doesn't want to take birth control, she doesn't have to. We're not subsidizing the forced birth control of women. It's their option to do it. And, you know, if you were to say maybe we shouldn't make it available to women past their 30s or whatever, um, I, even that I would probably take issue with. But I'd be more on board with that than, than for teenagers. Um, but even at that point, even with the spending that we do for women past their 30s, um, I mean, it still comes out as being cost effective. So, I mean, I, I, this idea that we're we're burdening the state by paying for them, that burden that you're talking about, that's only a moral burden on, on some people. That's not a financial burden because that really can't be demonstrated in any way. Well, it's not free. I mean, we're, we're paying for it at some point. Not the, but like... them getting pregnant isn't free either. Because, again, the people that need the most help, right? This was shown in the Chile study that the people that ended up getting pregnant when those when those um, companies colluded, the people that ended up getting pregnant, um, most of them were overrepresented in things like credit card debt, right? And most of those children, right? Prenatal environments are really important for kids, for the mother to be healthy, stress-free, um, to do what she can to, to make her pregnancy as healthy as possible. That These are the people. The people that you are providing free contraceptives to are oftentimes the people that need it the most. And when I say need it the most, I don't mean in like a touchy-feely way. I mean it in like a, these are people that <laughs> will be the largest fiscal burden on the state kind of way. These are the people that are going to leach the most health care off the system. They're going to have the highest chances of a kid being fucked and growing up and him in turn leeching off the system, right? That these effects will ripple throughout society. Whereas giving them access to contraception, again, like, you know, uh, to go back to the car analogy, we put a seatbelt in every single car, even though not every single person is going to be in a car that, you know, has an accident that requires the use of your seatbelt. Yeah, but putting the seatbelt in every car enables people to feel like there's a, a safety net there to protect them if they do get in an accident. And it, it, it in the safety belt analogy is not is not a perfect analogy, of course. But when you're providing people more and more opportunities to to engage in risky behavior, you are then enabling and, and subsidizing them doing so. And I think that really is is the difference so, uh, that, yeah, that we have. It is the difference, but you keep saying that, but the, but those numbers don't exist. If you ever if you find any after you can tweet at me or whatever, but like there is no study that says that as soon as contraception was made available, way more people started having sex. That just those numbers just don't exist. They don't exist anywhere. So the idea that we're enabling risky behavior doesn't that's that's just not true. Right. I, I know you you keep coming back to this link that oh there's no, there's no link you know perfectly demonstrating what what you know this factor of what you're saying and, and this other factor of what you're saying. And I'll agree you know I'll agree that I haven't I haven't found that you know there it may be out there and I haven't found that. But but we can we can look at what these things are doing to society as a whole and at, at to society more broadly. And we can say and I don't think anybody can can seriously deny that when you increase the access to to birth control you're then increasing people's ability to have no strings attached to sex, which we have seen increase since the since birth control has become more and more accessible. And so I think to, to sure, try but, to suggest that those two things aren't linked is kind of silly. Yeah, and I can maybe agree with that, that NSA sex is probably a lot easier with birth control. But now these are things that even if you feel strongly against them, and I understand that some people do. Again, I was born into a Catholic household. Um, even if you feel strongly against that, man, those arguments are way tougher than, than, the, than the fiscal or economic arguments against birth control, right? If somebody comes at you and says like, well, we can save money on the state, we can have less teen birth, we can have all these positives that I mentioned, but there is this one drawback 
back where now people are having more sex. Well, whether or not more sex is good or bad, that's up for debate. There's very different philosophical points of view on that uh, in terms of how people feel. Now, there are some people that will argue that that's bad. There are a lot of people probably today that would argue that that's good, but you won't find hardly anybody arguing that more single households for teens is good, that more teen pregnancy is good, that worse women's health is good, that worse economic viability of women is good, right? You won't find people arguing these things. So you can't really present these as like, um, these are the equivalent arguments on both ends. Like, now I know that you're saying this, however, more people will be having no strings attached sex. Like, well, okay. I mean, this is up for debate for whether this is even bad. And I can demonstrate that all of these things over here are very bad, you know? Yeah, no. And I, th I think that, you know, there's, that's, that's certainly true. And I think that we are totally, we're definitely coming at this from different, different angles, because again, like, you know, the, the primary argument that, that you've been making is a fiscal one. It's a financial one. And that's something that I, I am not, dis I'm not disputing those numbers mm -hmm. at all, but I, I think that I'm trying to argue this from more of a moral perspective. And, uh, you know, obviously you're coming from more of the, the sure. fiscal perspective. Even, so, no, even and, slightly, and I'm not, even slightly I'm morally, um, I, I'm at, believe it or not, I'm like the only fucking atheist libertarian I know. I'm actually very pro-life. I think abortion is a form of murder. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not even joking. I'm not being ironic when I say that. So my policies, too, are also geared at I want to reduce the number of abortions as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And teens are the most likely people to seek abortions as well. And you can demonstrate that less teens getting pregnant and more teens having access to contraception leads to less abortions as well. So even from mm -hmm. that like moral point of view that I feel strongly about, I think that, um, I, I think that having contraception available is an overwhelming positive um for, for the sex thing again like if i were to agree with you and, and i were to say that you know like sex is bad and and not teens or whatever shouldn't be engaging in sex that's fine and you can make that argument but attacking the birth control just doesn't seem to get you anywhere in terms of making any grounds there like you could concede that ground completely and say okay well contraception is available for everybody that's fine and then still go on your personal moral crusade against you know sex before marriage like okay well you have contraception for these reasons but you still shouldn't get um you shouldn't have a ton of sex because you um you know you open yourself to, for instance stds right whether or not you have access to contraception or not the std rates are pretty similar you know you're still just as likely to get an infection um if you're on any type of birth control or whatever so you can make a lot of arguments against sexual degeneracy and all of that while still having the contraception be freely available just because there are so many other benefits shown there and and again restricting access to, to to, um, restricting access to contraceptions for poor people doesn't help your point in getting less people to have sex because they do it anyway. The difference is just that when they used to do it, they were already married because people got married at absurdly early ages. Yeah, no, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of truth to that. Hey, uh, before we go here, we're closing under the hour mark. Um, I wanted to bring up something that uh, that's directly related to this topic. It is mm -hmm. something that you know, in my my uh, history, learning about uh, political science and and uh, U.S. Uh, history, uh, reproductive rights history in America, it's the idea of the voluntary sterilization. Now we talk about, um, I think we can both agree that that forced sterilization is uh, probably a, a moral wrong. You know, we can both argue that from a libertarian perspective as being a wrong thing and from an individual rights perspective. Um, but what about the topic of, of voluntary sterilization? Now this is something that's been experimented with in Europe a little bit, uh, where they will subsidize you to, to get sterilized if you don't want to have kids. Um, what do we what do you think about that? Because it's something that is kind of a, a new um, idea that's that's resurfacing now with a lot of this birth control uh, debate coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and like I mentioned at the start, this is an area where people could could save a lot of money. People who are especially people who are uh, impoverished, you know, if they were to get a check for a thousand dollars to to not have a kid, there could be a great financial benefit to the state there. Um, what do you think about that? Um, OK, so personally for me, I used to be a hardcore libertarian. Now I'm pretty left leaning. Um, the reason for that was because philosophically, I'm very much a libertarian, but I prag pragmatism always comes first for me. So I'm, I'm always interested in what are the actual effects on society. And then um, I, I hope that my philosophy will inform how I feel about that, if that makes sense. So when you talk about something like the, the idea that you could volunteer for sterilization. So philosophically, um, volunteering for sterilization sounds good. Uh, because the, the state isn't forcing you to do it, and I'm usually okay with people making their own decisions. Um, pragmatically, I would have to see how that plays out, because if you're offering money to do it, you might be incentivizing certain groups of people to, to, to be doing this, or certain classes of people to be doing it. I don't know like how um, you get into like a borderline eugenics argument there, which even eugenics, I understand there can be arguments for it on both sides. Um, I would definitely say yes if this was sterilization that can be reversed. Um, for instance, like vasectomies, mm. I think, can be reversed pretty easily. I don't know about um, for women if their forms of sterilization are reversible or not. 
but um uh, yeah i don't know that's a, that's a pretty tough one i'd have to think about that a lot um that's kind of like a, kind of a similar-ish argument is like um is it okay for the military to offer a lot of money for people to join because then the idea is that you would only get the poor people fighting your wars because poor people would be incentivized to sign up because of the fight and is that a moral you know a morally acceptable or not um yeah it, it happens anyways already like, <laughs> yeah of course yeah but but i mean the, the, there's the argument of whether or not that that kind of thing should be okay or not so yeah it's kind of an interesting um thing i'm not sure Why, what, what are your feelings on that well, you know, I, I um, you know, came from a very Christian background, and so I, I had that, I guess, innate uh, revulsion to that idea when I first heard about it. But the more and more I thought about it, I, I thought that this could actually be, if we if we want to go down the cost saving route, if we want to go down the the route of, you know, eliminating the the uh, draws on society and eliminating the the uh, like you talked about, you know, mm -hmm. increasing spending for police forces and increasing, uh, you know, burden on the welfare state, then I think there's there's a, a lot of strong arguments to be made in favor of voluntary. Uh, paid sterilization because you would get the people who tend to uh, you know give birth to criminals and and give birth to people who then end up to <laughs> have more and more kids that that are uh, societal problems you would get those people signing up for the sterilization programs and so you know yes it, it may have a disparate impact on on certain groups over other groups mm -hmm. but I think the the disparate impact they would have would ultimately be better for society and would ultimately be be cost saving for society you would get a lot less crime I mean this is one of my my um, um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because uh, we probably disagree about Roe v. Wade. Uh, I, I, you know, am more supportive of Ro Roe v. Wade. And after Roe v. Wade, 18 years after Roe v. Wade was passed, you saw a drastic in, uh, decrease in and the black. amount of violent crime being committed in America. Mm -hmm. sure. What's that? Well, I, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure um, abortion doesn't that disproportionately disproportionately affect like black Americans, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. I know I've heard the eugenics um, argument that's been made in terms of abortion, that abortion has allowed eugenics to occur in the black community. That's something that I've heard. If, you're, if your initial argument was something like, or your initial proposition was like sterilization that wasn't, that they didn't pay money for, I would probably be a lot more likely to say yes, but it's just financially incentivizing that becomes very worrisome for me. Um, just cause, cause like 18 year olds are really dumb. Like, I don't know, like if an 18 year old person is like, Oh dude, a thousand bucks. Like I'm going to go fucking do it. You know, like, um, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. That kind of stuff just makes me really nervous. Um, it just well, hey, terms, like, know, again, the pragmatic way of how it plays out, but yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's kind of a new idea. I mean, we should, uh, let's, let's think more about this and, and maybe, uh, you know, have another conversation about this at the, at a later date, because it's certainly a topic that I've been seeing discussed more and more, uh, lately online. And I'm sure reproductive health will be in the news, uh, for a lot, uh, for the foreseeable future. I mean, as Trump does more and more, um, on the topic, people are going to be more and more incensed about it. I can, mm -hmm. I can already, I can already tell. Um, Hey, so where can people find you? Thanks for, first of all, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. It's good to have the conversation, uh, in person and not over, uh, over a snippy quote tweets, which yeah. I know is, uh, is, is always a positive. So where can people find you? What, what do you do? What's your, what's your niche and, uh, where can people find you on Twitch and the YouTube? Um, if you just go to my website, I think it's destiny.gg. All my links are at the top. I do pretty much 50, 50 split now between video games and politics. So cool. Good stuff. Well, Hey, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks have for a good night. Me. Yeah, you too. Cool. Cool. We're offline. All right, thanks cool. again. Yep. Thanks a lot. Fuck, I didn't have some, I looked up so many stats for this and I still didn't have some um, overall single parent households was a stat that we missed. Has that actually increased? That's a stat that I missed, even though I had the um, even though I had the teenage things. And then um, my PP is small. I think we were pretty, I think we were pretty prepared here. I feel okay about this. Um, G O D S T I N Y. Page 43. This is from the CDC. All right. Birth rates for unmarried women by age of mother, United States, 1970, 1975, 1980 to 2014, and by age and race of Hispanic origin of the mother. You know, Hispanic and black are different, right? Oh, black total. Okay. And Hispanic word. Okay. Thanks again for banning bomb gin. 
So birth rates for unmarried women. Birth rates for unmarried women, 15 to 44, for black people, has decreased from 98 to 2014. Um, One year of fuck Brent boys. Have single parent households decreased though? Because those aren't necessarily the same. You could argue that black people get divorced still and the single parent households has increased. He was trying really hard to justify being a virgin. That's kind of mean. Next page continues. Oh, I can't. I see. So from 81% in. Oh, no. Damn. So the worst was in 1990 at 90%. So were you an altar boy when you were in Catholic school? Craigasm. So in 25 years, it's gone from 9.5% to 61.5%. You fucking did, did destiny. I never thought I'd see the day, but you did it. Not percent, it's Angel per 1,000 women. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I was going to say, these numbers seem ungodly fucking high. Rates are births to unmarried women per 1,000. I was going to say, in 1990, 91% of black people were in a single were born to single mothers. That's fucking crazy. But I guess the number's over 100 here. I didn't look over here. Yeah, that makes more sense. Um, what about single parent households? That was another stat that he brought up. Single parent household rate. Oh, I even searched for this. United States. I even looked this up. Why didn't I record this stat? Majority that guy was really pens. mad that people are having sex and he is not. Bonus meme, Nathan got too. Between 1960 and 2016, the percentage of children living in families with two parents decreased from 88 to 69. Of those 50.7 million children living in families with two parents, 47 with two married parents, 30 with two unmarried parents. They had me to Lord's Mobile Guild. Doesn't have to be you. Started last night and at about 100,000 might as of now. Name is Heflix, no caps. So it looks like um, the percentage of children living in families with two parents has decreased, right? I accidentally used my prime sub on you, so now I can't art easy W. Do you have these queued up in Spam Labs? Meme. Oh no, I think Bonus people actually waited. Um, I don't know. Do we have any? Um, I don't know. Are there any final questions or anything for this? Um, I prepared an outline, but I didn't really get to control the flow of the conversation. So I try to do this thing where every person I debate, we try to steal like one of their one of their abilities, kind of like what Walt does when he kills people in Breaking Bad. And I like this. I like the Fuentes approach to outlining the I conversations. I love your left ear too much. Help. Um, going in, but I didn't really control the flow of the conversation. It would have been really nice to move from point to point. I didn't do that at all. I, I can practice that, though. We can do better for that. Um, I could have memorized my sources better so that I could cite them a little bit quicker, I think. Um, like that Chile... Wait, was it Chile? Oh, shit, no. Hold on. Um, hold on, fuck. Let me find this. Oh wait, what about weak? 
Oh, here we go. Um, I thought this was really interesting. So a study published in the National Bureau of Economic Research in October of 2017, this study was published like, like I think two days ago. Our estimates suggest that due to the price hike, the weekly birth rate increased by 4%. Um, I think this was in Chile where um, we use sharp, massive, and unexpected price increases of oral contraceptives, product of a documented case of collusion among pharmaceutical retailers in Chile as a natural experiment to estimate the impact of access to the pill. Mega Man Let on fertility and the newborn health. Our empirical strategy combines multiple sources of information and takes into account the seasonality of conceptions and the general trends of fertility, as well as the dynamics that arise after interrupting the pill's intake. Our estimates suggest that due to the price hike, the weekly birth rate increased by 4%. We show large effects on the number of children born to unmarried mothers from mothers in their early 20s. Here's what I learned in his channel. You won. You're short. You're circumcised. Nate probably is too, and you're something called a soy boy. Who won the debate? A. James. B. James. C. James. Nice. We show large effects on the number of children born to unmarried mothers from mothers in their early 20s and to um, prima, prima pari parish women. I don't know what this means. Moreover, we find evidence of the significant deterioration of newborn health as measured by the incidence of low birth weight and infant mortality. We suggest that the extra conception faced dire conditions during gestation. Um as a result of the mother's unhealthy behaviors. In addition, we document a disproportional increase of 27% in the weekly miscarriage and stillbirth rates, which we interpret as manifestations of active efforts of termination in a country where abortion was illegal. As the extra children reach school age, we find lower school enrollment rates and higher participations in programs for students with special needs. Our results suggest that access to contraceptives may prevent conceptions that will turn out to be relatively poor in health and thereby may improve the average health of children conceived. This was a really interesting study. Um, I thought. Um, did we miss anything else? Do you have any other final questions before I wrap this up? Um, maybe after these um, discussions, I can make these. I guess I can make these like um, publicly available. Isn't there a way to like get a shared link? Fuck. There's I hope to do everyone it. is having a great day. Am I missing the share word? Oh, share. It's right here. My bad. But um, my goal for this conversation, um, my goal for this conversation was from the start, I said, um, I wanted to, him to retreat to moral grounds because I think at that point, I think the argument has been made sufficiently for my end. If I can get him to admit, and I think I did on all these points, right? I got him to admit that money can be saved by the state. I got him to admit that, um, that we can reduce the number of abortions. We didn't talk about this too much, um, that we can reduce the numbers of teens getting pregnant. We got him to admit that, and that we didn't really talk about the health impact much. It sounded like he started to drop that. I was familiar with that. I was familiar with that 2007 study because you guys made me read this Breitbart shit. And that first study that he cited, um, oh, it was a 2009 study. I said 2007. It was a 2009 study from the University of Texas. I knew this exact study um, because you guys brought it up on stream two days ago. And this only has to do with one particular type of birth control. It didn't have to do with oral contraception. It was one particular type. So I'm really glad that we brought that article up because I would have been lost here. So I actually researched this last night. Um, I actually went through his Twitter because a lot of people were tweeting ideas at him when he accepted this debate. So I went through all of their tweets and I looked up a lot of the counter arguments there too. So I actually prepared for this quite a bit and we didn't really get to talk even much about what, um, about all the stuff that I had prepared for it. But um, yeah, I think you can't out all the points because you never transition. You keep asking questions to break apart their arguments, but then things are going their way. They take the initiative to move on and then the cycle repeats. Oh yeah, maybe. I can't believe you remember that article from Breitbart so well. I mean, I just read it like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty easy. Um, yeah, I was also kind of curious because he started to argue about sterilization at the end. But is he in favor of that? Because sterilization would do everything birth control does, right? That's kind of an interesting argument. I would have to think about that a lot. But, uh, but I, I said as much to him that I would worry that the incentives would be there for that might not be good. Destiny, that's always what happens. He's right. You break them down, but never move on. I guess 
the reason why I never move on, I guess, is because I'm always wor I'm always trying to drill down to what I consider right. If we if our arguments, my argument starts here and his argument starts here, I want to settle at some point to where we've gotten to the as close to the truth claim as possible. So if I say that A is one and he says that A is two, I want to argue this until we come to some agreement and then and my goal is to move them to one. And if we don't get here and I can only move them to here or here or here or whatever, then at some point they have to agree to move on. Right. Because I'm never going because I believe that my points are true. So I'm never going to stop arguing them. Right. But maybe I maybe at some point, if I feel like I've sufficiently expressed my point, maybe I should just move on. I don't know. What if they move me? I mean, if they have the better argument, then yeah, they would. Um, do we have any? When you debate in public, it's not about getting the other person to agree. It's about getting the audience to your side. So <clears throat> I was talking about this earlier with Aaron. When I have these kinds of discussions, um, when I do... When I do spontaneous content, that's what I excel at, right? I excel at conversations on the fly, and I excel at doing live content. This is what I do the best at. My standard for prepared content is much, much, much higher. This is why I have such a problem doing it. Like, I don't think that what I do off the dome is worthy of being, like, put into a video and being put out as, like, this is the argument or whatever, right? I don't agree with that. So... I kind of take a similar approach to these kinds of debates. If I'm going to start preparing research and outlines for these conversations, it's not enough for me to just pull people from the middle. I genuinely want people on his side, very firmly rooted on his side, to start to question that narrative. Uh, my, my, my standard for who I want converted becomes higher at this point. So when we start these arguments, I don't just want people in the middle to go like, oh yeah, Destiny's got some good ideas. I want people on his side to go, hmm, you know, even though I kind of agree with him, he didn't really look that great in this conversation. Or I don't really think he brought up a lot of good counter arguments. Right, those are the kinds of thoughts that I want to um, foster. Kind of like in my Dick debate, right? His hardcore supporters will always love him. But when you looked in some of the more neutral subreddits, a lot of Dick Masterson's fans were saying those kinds of things, which felt really good, right? The, the things that like, well, I'm a huge Dick fan. I love him when he comes on this podcast. But he came off as really bad in this conversation. Or it seemed like he didn't really know what he was saying, right? That's kind of the goal with, with the more prepared, more structured debates. Um, Destiny, this guy and his supporters and other people in the alt-light and alt-right, they really, really seriously care about the idea of moral degeneracy. Many of them are nationalists, not libertarians or classical liberals. They aren't adverse to the state overstepping bounds, and they aren't afraid of destroying contemporary moral norms. Unfortunately, these freely moral philosophical arguments are their bread and butter and have been since Weimar in the 1920s. But that's okay. I'm okay with that. I actually like that more. Um, I... I I like that people are being more honest today because they're being braver in their, in their political ideas, right? So it used to be that, like, neoconservatives and whatnot were pretty blanketly fucking racist against black people, but they wouldn't come right out and say it, right? These things would take other forms, like redlining or gentrification or restriction to welfare or dr mandatory drug testing for welfare people or papers, please, in Arizona or stop and frisk in New York, right? They had these ways of kind of getting around it, not being actually racist, but doing it for the betterment of America, for everybody to be happy, right? But now they're just plain coming out and saying, like, well, I hate black people. Get them out of the fucking country. I don't want any more Hispanics coming here. Only white Europeans. Get these fuckers out. Right? I like that. Because, okay, well, now we can have... If you want to do that, firstly, it means that you've seeded every single economic argument, which is cool. If you want to seed everything, you've already lost a huge support, right? If you want to say that, like, well, economically and, and pragmatically, your ideas are horrible, right? If you want to retreat into only philosophical grounds, um, then you can start taking up those arguments. I, and I think those arguments can be fruitful. That's fine. Um... I think that you can defend the idea that you shouldn't have a white ethno state. That shouldn't scare you. If it scares you to engage a Nazi in philosophical debate over whether or not that the motherland should exist for only whites, like um, I, I mean, read some arguments. It's not that hard. I don't think to argue against that kind of stuff.
Um, is this it? Anything else? I have like some research and shit I have to do. I've got stuff I have to do tomorrow. We have to play that Eve game tomorrow, and I need to like actually like read a lot about it and start playing it so I can do that. Do we have any other like questions or anything regarding this? Um, I think I'm relatively well versed in this now. Um, or I, I mean, like surface level shit. So Stin one, I can't tell if you're being, um, I can't tell if you're being ironic or not, but I don't think that I made no bullshit popular. He was probably always going to become somewhat popular. I don't think I made him. Same thing with the Aiden Paladin chick. I mean, these are just people. There's a million of these types of people on YouTube that like kind of do the alt right talking points to get popular that never interacted with me. I agree with you chipping away slowly on more neutral lines due to the gro overly grow. Due to the overly grow on the internet, I don't know what that means. Doesn't it make more sense to change their opinion as you might change more and break their flow of growing? Wait, whose opinion? Oh, you mean like have an argument with him on like the moral grounds of whether or not people should be able to have sex or not? You made JonTron popular? <laughs> The problem is they can still win without the rational arguments we hold dear. Them conceding these points mean nothing um, to so many people. Personally, I'm scared by the fact that they feel so secure and brazen about their racism, but I'm not afraid to engage these sets of people, but I'm a historian by trade who studies the Nazis. This has all happened before. So the pro here is one of the big problems, okay, that I feel is like a really big problem. And maybe people won't agree with me, but I think that I think that one of the most important things that, that you can do today in society, and maybe my views have just been changed on this because I talked to GF so much, um, I think that philosophy is really, really important. Like one of the most important things that you can engage with because it dismisses this idea that all ideas are equal, right? That w when you take a more structured approach to establishing like moral foundations and then building principles off of that, when you take a more structured approach to doing that, you can start to see that like, well, no. What you just said, that's not, no, you don't actually believe that. Or it gives you the ability to deconstruct people's philosophies um, w without- Do you um, think there will be a Twitter poll deciding who won this time? Right. Kappa. Um, it gives you the ability to kind of deconstruct people's moral arguments and, and to really start to poke and prod for, for, to, into a lot of their shit. So I feel that, um, I think that engaging with people philosophically and doing like just a little bit, like just the barest amount of like groundwork that I've done in terms of like reading into philosophy, I think that like having this ability to to axiomatically construct like a, a foundational system of morals and ethics and then to build principles off that, that if you were to start to tackle people that only exist here and here, that you can easily destroy, right? It's so easy to find contradictions in people's beliefs when they haven't engaged with their material on a deeper level, right? Like a really easy way, a lot of reasons why people stop being a libertarian, right? Easy way to engage with libertarians, right? Hey, you're a libertarian, right? Yep. How do you feel about immigration? I fucking hate it. I don't want these people coming here and ruining the country. That's very strange. So as a libertarian, you believe that the free market is the most important thing. Exactly. I think the free market is very important. Okay, well then why do you want to arbitrarily restrict access to labor? And free-flowing labor is a very important part of any market. Um, well, right. So when you expose these contradictions in their platform, you have to, they have to abandon some idea. Right? They have to leave something behind. And if you're capable of engaging with their entire philosophical platform and understanding it, then you can kind of reveal like, well, this isn't really consistent with this, right? Pick one, right? And, and you can only do that if you if you have like the like the mental tools to actually take apart someone's belief system, right? Okay, so so like for libertarians, it used to be really fine, right? Okay, you don't believe in immigration, but you also say you're a hardcore proponent of the free market. These two ideas are not compatible, so you need to pick one now. You're either not a libertarian or... You, you, you actually are okay with, with relatively unrestricted immigration, right? While doing something about the welfare state, right? You have to pick one. You can't have both of these because if you do, you're full of shit because these two ideas stem from totally different principles, right? From totally different axiomatic foundations. And you can do that a lot with a lot of different people um, with a lot of different types of ideas. Hopefully when, um, hopefully when we argue with Nick Fuentes, I can demonstrate some of this, hopefully. <clears throat> I 
I think you were too naive about this. People don't have to pick one. They can use different frameworks for different things. They can say, I support the free market if there are exceptions, but then your whole argument falls apart. No, that would force them to, no, because they would have to become more relativist at that point, which nobody is, right? That, that's right. That's true, right? If you want to say that there is some set of morals that will apply here, but it's just totally different over here, then you're like morally relativistic. And if you're going to be a more relativist, then what argument do you have for fucking anything, right? And then anything can change at any point in time. And you would have to admit that your morals are totally relative. Um, in, in which case, I don't think... I don't think any sane person would be willing to defend that platform, right? <clears throat> That's not true at all. How is that not true at all? If you say that you are a libertarian, okay? If you say that you are a libertarian and you believe in open, you believe the market is the best thing in the world and everything should serve the market and the market serves the people. And then you also believe that, well, immigration needs to be restricted. These are two contradictory ideas. You can't apply a different set of rules to both of these things. You have to demonstrate how does increased immigration play into your free market thing? How does that possibly work? You have to reconcile these two ideas. You can't say you've got a totally different set of values for each unless you're, unless you're um like like morally relativistic right you're using the term moral relativism in a way that is very different than it is used in philosophical setting okay is it maybe this isn't moral relativism and maybe i'm speaking out of let's look it up hold on Moral relativism may be any of several philosophical positions concerned with the difference in moral judgments across different people and cultures. Descriptive moral relativism holds that some people do in fact disagree about what a what is moral, meta-ethical moral relativism holds that in such agreements nobody is objectively right or wrong, and normative moral relativists hold that because nobody is right or wrong, we ought to tolerate the behavior of others even when we disagree with the moral. Okay, never mind. This wouldn't really be moral relativism. I'm sorry. This is not. That's not true. I blame my chat on that one. This is how it was described to me by a chatter, okay? But this is how I learn philosophy. Usually 10 people will tell me about something, and most of them will be wrong, but eventually we hone in on what it is when we finally look it up. <laughs> Yeah, you could just call it philosophical consistency, I guess. You could argue that they're being philosophically inconsistent between their two positions, but you wouldn't call it um, moral relativism. Where is Momo's 2DS? No state, Nathan Weeb. Can't you just say you're a free market advocate except when it harms the nation? Well, but the problem there is that now you're saying, I am a libertarian and I believe in the free market, except when it harms the nation. Okay, well now I'm going to tell you all the ways that the free market harms the nation, and now you have to tell me why you disagree with government intervention here, right? So say I say that um, not having um, uh, public access to health care. Destiny, you're today's date to me because you're a 10 out of 10. Thanks, Apollos. 31 months. So let's say I want to argue for the existence of single payer health care. And you go, well, no, I'm a libertarian. I hate that. Well, not having single payer health care massively harms the nation. What's your argument now? Well, okay, the massive harm to the nation isn't exactly what I... Okay, well, now we have to go back to immigration. Why do you want the government to intervene in our labor markets then? Okay, now you have to find a new argument, right? So a, a, if, if they want to use an argument to justify immigration, well, now you can take that same argument and apply it to a ton of other topics to test for consistency, right? Your philosophy about free speech and exchange of ideas requires people to actively think about those ideas. You've said yourself that you don't believe most people do. Doesn't it make your ideas pretty unpragmatic? Well, I understand that most people don't, and they'll just parrot whatever they hear, I guess, it sounds the best. So I try to make my shit sound the best, right? Um, that's why we're working on rhetoric so much, right? I want to come off sounding informed about these discussions, and I want my points to sound the best. And then if people parrot me, at least they're parroting the, the right shit, right?
The Ian guy is like really fucking creepy. I don't know why the fuck he's tweeting anything at me. This guy is a huge piece of shit. I hate this guy. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not even going to tweet at him. I hate this dude. Um, okay, I'm done. I love you guys. Um, we'll be streaming some memes tomorrow. Stay safe. Be careful. I'm eating a cannoli today, and it's great. And I'm about to kill my son. <laughs> Alright, anyway, have fun, guys. Be careful. Stay safe. Ripperino, cappuccino, pappuccino, pappuccino, cappuccino, my dudes. Peace out.